So you see this is, I hope you can see the screen now. This is a simple introductory tutorial which uh, will help you understand the need for using the concept of transmission lines and some of the basic principles in transmission lines. We'll be sharing the next uh, tutorial soon. I'll also share the solutions for this tutorial uh, soon. All right, so we go on to today's So to sum up what we did in the last class, What we did is the following. If I connect a source with an internal element to a load using a transmission line of length L, remember our Z reference was Z equal to 0 at the load end, the characteristic impedance of the line is Z0, what the line and the load put together will pose is an equivalent impedance Z in, the effective impedance posed by the line and the load put together is Z in. So as far as the circuit theory is concerned, once we know the effective input impedance of the line plus the load, that is good enough to, that is enough to design our circuit impedance matching, etc. So for example, let Zs be the source impedance. For maximum power transfer theorem, we would demand that this Zs equal to Z in prime instead of instead of having demanding Zs is equal to Zl prime, we will now demand Zs is equal to Zn prime because that is the effective impedance posed by the line plus the load. And remember this Zn depends on Z0, the length line and the Zl along with beta or the omega, the frequency. This is a useful relation to remember, Z0, Zl plus J tan, J Z0 tan beta L divided by Z0 plus J Zl uh, tan beta L. This is what we derived the last class, right. Now, this is one idea. So, I can reach the line and the load with an effective impedance Z. We are also looking at how would you use a transmission line. So we said if I have a line, transmission line, which is open circuited, which means my ZL is infinity. When I have an open circuit line, I substitute ZL equal to infinity in this relation. I get the effective impedance of the line, which is what we derived last time, right? So if you substitute ZL is equal to infinity, this you, you can pull out ZL and you can do some substitutions here. Uh, you will get this as the effective impedance will be minus J Z naught cot beta L. 
Now, when you have this as a short circuit line where L equal to 0, I substitute ZL equal to 0 in this, I get effective impedance as, uh, this is probably what we did last time, JZ0 tan beta L. Because your ZL is 0, Z0 gets cancelled, you have just J Z0, uh, this Z0 gets cancelled, what you have is J Z0 tan beta. So, this is the effective impedance posed by an open circuit line and a short circuit transmission line. Remember the length of the line is L, the characteristic impedance of the line is Z0. And you have a certain beta which means you have a certain omega which is uh, applied to the line which means the, the point is the effective impedance is now depending on the frequency as your frequency changes your effective impedance is changing. As your length of the line changes, the effective impedance is changing and of course, as the material or the way you construct the line changes, your Z0 is changing. Now, we said we would you could use this, use for example, so we were looking at applications of transmission lines and you could use this, uh, for example, a short circuited line as an uh, inductance as a pure inductance or as a pure capacitance at high frequencies. You also discussed why a regular uh, inductance or a capacitance would not work at very high frequencies. The leads of the capacitor would start having giving inductive reactance. Similarly, the coil of the inductance would start posing some capacitance. So, at higher frequencies, you would, it is very hard to get pure inductance and pure capacitance. And so, transmission line, a short circuit transmission line or an open circuit transmission line with an appropriate design, design is going to be useful to make a pure inductor or a pure capacitor. We will do an example problem to uh, prove this or to drive home this idea. Uh, the question is this, let us say we want to, uh, we are operating at a frequency of high frequency 2.25 gigahertz, frequency at which uh, the, the carrier frequency of your probably your uh, 3G or your cell phone signals. The characteristic impedance of the line let us say is 50 ohms. You are assuming pure real which means you are assuming a lossless line. Question is find the length of the line or maybe the short circuited line which can pose a capacitance of let us say 4 picofarad. Question is you want to make a capacitance of 4 picofarad using not two plates of the capacitance and a dielectric in between. You want to make use of that capacitance, you want to make that capacitance using a transmission line. You want to make that capacitance using a transmission line. Let us say the velocity is 0.75 C in the system. So, how do you go about doing this? So, instead of using a 4 picofarad capacitor, I am going to use an equivalent a short circuited line. This is what it means. Uh, are you sure that they are able to see the uh, notepad? Are they able to see the note? Because what is projected is that question, the tutorial. Oh, they are able, they are able to see. Okay. All right. So, um, question is, instead of using a 4 picofarad 
capacitance, what you want to use is a transmission line. This is not a pulse that I have drawn. This is a transmission line of length L and a characteristic impedance Z0. You want to find out what is the length of the line that I can use, which would behave as if it is a 4 picofarad capacitor. You understand the idea? Instead of using two metal plates and a dielectric to give you a capacitance of 4 picofarad, what we are saying is that I can take a transmission line of length, if, if it is a coaxial line, I can take a coaxial line, I can do a short circuit, I can short circuit this end of the coaxial line. So, if I imagine in terms of a coaxial line, it is going to look like this. I have a line, inner line, inner conductor, outer, and I choose a specific length and I am just doing a shorting of the inner line to the outer line. That is going to work like a capacitance. That is the claim. Question is, what should be the length of that line such that it can work as a capacitor? which will give you a capacitance of exactly 4 farad. So, how would you go about doing this? You know that for short circuit, if ZL is short circuit, the input impedance for short circuit case is J, just now we wrote down, JZ0 tan beta L. Right. Now, if I were to plot this J Z naught tan beta L as a function of length of the line, I know that at, so this is my reference Z equal to 0, the load end is at Z equal to 0. So, at L equal to 0, I will have tan 0, which is 0 and I will get the first minima, first uh, turning, this beta L becomes or tan beta L becomes infinite when beta L becomes pi by 2 or when L becomes pi by 2 beta which is pi 2 pi by lambda which is at lambda by 4. So, at L equal to minus lambda by 4 because my L is in the negative direction, I will have the first infinity. This is how it is going to behave. This is at lambda by 4. Now, at lambda by 2, I will have the next 0 and because at lambda by 2, what, what is the situation? So, when you have tan beta L is 0. In fact, this is the case of the first infinity, shortest distance which is giving you infinity. But at every multiple of integer multiple of lambda by, uh, well, for every odd multiple of lambda by 4, you will have the same situation happening. You will have this going to infinity. So, the point is, if I plot tan beta L versus L or the Z in versus L, I am going to get a behavior like this. Because between lambda by 4 and lambda by 8, what happens, happens this tan beta L would be negative. So, you will have it negative. So, you will have between, so this is lambda by 2, this would be 3 lambda by 4. So, in this region you will have positive, in this region you will have so, if I choose a length such that it is between 0 to lambda by 4 or between lambda by 2 to 3 lambda by 4 and so on, you can keep finding the multiples. Your Zn is positive. What is the meaning of positive Zn? It simply means that J Z0 tan beta L, I can equate let us say I need a capacitance C. I, I need a capacitance C. What is the capacitive reactance? Capacitive reactance is 1 over J omega C 
which means minus j 1 over omega c. So, what should be the length range I should choose? You see, I want minus j times something. So, if I want a capacitance, I should be choosing the region corresponding to the case the effective impedance is Zn is negative. Zn is negative, which means if I choose a length in the range, if my if my length uh, if my length is in this range lambda by 2 less than length less than well I should be writing it as since since you have a negative sign here I should be writing it this way if my length length lambda by 4 less than length less than lambda by 2 which is in this region I get the effective impedance negative and I need it negative because I am looking for a capacitive reactance. So, and, and what is that? It is Z0 tan beta L. J Z0 tan beta L. So, in this region, what it simply means is that in, in for L in this region, this is negative. So, I choose a length that region and then the magnitude of the effective impedance which is this is decided by how much is the capacitance that I want. Which means I can say that if my 1 omega, one over omega uh, is the capacitance that I want that should be equivalent to Z naught tan beta. So, I have in the question, I know what is the frequency, I know what is the uh, beta because my velocity is given, I can the only Z naught is given, the only unknown is length. The other way of doing brute force doing this is to simply say that you know your minus J 1 over omega C is equal to you have minus j z naught tan beta l because you have already chosen that this length such that this is negative. So, your c equivalent is 1 over omega z naught tan beta l. You know what is the c that you want, you know the frequency you want, you know what is the z naught of the line. The only unknown is l. Beta is 2 pi by lambda, right. So, you know uh, if your if your so beta so beta l is how do you find l that is actually you have all the information to find the beta l because this is 2 pi by lambda which is omega over uh, velocity. So, you can figure out what is the uh, this is omega over c where you you know what is the omega over the velocity. So, you know velocity is given to you omega is known to you. So, we know substitute and find out what is the value of it. So, remember this L when we write here that is the shortest or the smallest length that can satisfy this condition. When I say it is between lambda by 2 and lambda by 2. So, you could also have lengths which are added by every lambda by 2 which will satisfy this condition. You would always prefer a shortest line because if there are any effects of loss or if there are any effects of dispersion you want to minimize that. So, you would try to choose the shortest length. So, only unknown in this 
beta uh, sorry length and so you can solve for L and what I want to remind you is that this is the shortest length. Any length plus so if I solve and find L any multiple of lambda by 2 would also satisfy the same uh, condition. So that is also fine for you. But as I said earlier for practical reasons you try to minimize the length of the line so that you, your other losses can be minimized. So similarly you find out if I operate in this region it would work like an inductor. So you can design inductors also with short circuited line. So as the length changes it keeps working like an inductor or like a capacitor. The other interesting thing here is from the short circuit open circuit case is that uh, if you go back and look at here the effective impedance for the short circuit case is this whereas for the open circuit case is this. Let me just repeat that. So Z short circuit was uh, J Z naught tan beta L, the effective impedance when it is short circuited. Z open circuit is minus J Z naught cot beta L. This information is also very powerful because it will help you to find Z naught practically. Let us say you have a coaxial transmission line. From our original definition of Z0, Z0 was related to R, J, uh, sorry, R, L, uh, C, G and omega. It was under root R plus J omega L divided by G plus, uh, J, G plus J omega C and so on. Which means if I want to find Z0, I better know what is the resistance per unit length, inductance per unit length, capacitance per unit length, conductance per unit length and so on which is essentially decided what decides for example inductance per unit length. It is decided by the kind of the material that you use to make the transmission line, what is the dielectric between the two wires and so on. There is a way to calculate all that which we will do in tomorrow's class. But this information that we have that when you short circuit a line the effective impedance is this and when you open circuit a line the effective impedance is this information is helping you to find Z0 quickly in a very practical way. Can you guess how? All what you need to do is take the transmission line, for example, if it is a coaxial line, you are going to have a central conductor and an outer conductor. What you need to do is first keep the central conductor and outer conductor open, simulating this case. Let us say L is the length of the line. Use put a multimeter and you know measure the impedance. That should be this, whatever is beta L etc. Similarly, the next thing you do is short circuit the two ends. Do this measurement. What should be the product? Z S C Z O C. J times J is minus one, and there is a negative. This is Z0 square tan beta L cos beta L cancels out. So Z0 is simply under root of Z. Z0. This gives us a quick way of measuring Z0 in a lab. You can go and try in your lab. Take the coaxial cable, the BNC cable that you use to connect the kernel generator to your oscilloscope. At the open circuit condition, measure what is the imp impedance. Short circuit condition, measure what is the impedance, do square root of ZSC, ZOC, that is going to be the characteristic impedance of the line. So in that sense, this is a very useful relation. I can quickly measure what is this without knowing R, L, G, N, C. Without actually knowing those parameters, I can measure ZO. 
The other thing that you can do with the transmission line in terms of application is the following. You can even though transmission line itself is posing some of these uh, issues that is quite dirty if you are trying to just use circuit theory, but there are some good advantages of that also. Uh, you could use transmission line as an impedance matching circuit. Now, you are going to see how to use that. How do you use a line as an impedance matching circuit? So, this is the idea. Let us say I have a line with characteristic impedance Z0 with a length which is lambda by 4. Length is lambda by 4, so it is called as a quarter wave line. Now, you know if length is lambda by 4, you already worked out that beta L would be 2. Because if length is lambda by 4, that is exactly what we worked out here, right? Lambda by 4, you get beta L. Now, in that case, your input impedance Z in, let us say the load that I am connecting is Z L. Z in will be Z naught times you know this relation Z L plus J Z naught tan beta L Z naught plus J Z L tan beta L. Now, if length is lambda by 4 irrespective of uh, well, well, when length is lambda by 4 your beta L is pi by 2. So, tan beta is going to blow up. So, you handle that by taking this tan beta L out of as a common factor. So, you get Z L over tan beta L plus J Z naught divided by again tan beta L comes out Z naught plus J Z naught over tan beta L J Z L and then L lambda by 4 uh, this cancels out, tan beta L goes to infinity. So, this term, so all what left with is Z in is J cancels out, you have Z naught square by Z in. Simply means that if I have a length lambda by 4, then the input impedance posed by the line plus the load Z naught over there is no beta L dependence here. There is no length dependence. There is no, well, there is a length dependence. You have already fixed the length as lambda by 4. But irrespective of your frequency, you have Z in is Z naught square by Z in. It is not true to say that completely because frequency is what decides lambda by 4. Frequency is what decides lambda. Now, the point is how are we going to use this for impedance matching? So, this is the idea. Let us say I want to match a line whose impedance is Z01 to a load whose impedance is ZL. So, the problem state is to match Z01 with a load ZL. 
I want to connect a transmission line whose characteristic impedance is ZO1 to a load with impedance ZL, all right. And of course, the impedance of these two are not identical. So, there is an impedance mismatch because of which there will be reflections, right. Now, you want to find out how can we do this matching of ZO1 to another impedance Z. The idea is to use line with length lambda by 4, impedance ZO2, alright. So, this is the you are using it for impedance matching. Remember, I am using length is lambda by 4. What would this do? What is the Z in here? Z in should be Z O square by Z L. That is what we derived. Z in should be Z O square divided by Z L. So, this Z in should be Z O square. Instead of Z O, I have Z O 2 here. So, this is Z O 2 square divided by Z L. What should I want? What, what is my demand? The input impedance seen by this should be equal to Z. This should be equal to Z01 for impedance matching. Because we know for impedance matching, this should be equal to the effective impedance posed by this line plus the load. If it matches with this Zn, then I have a matched case. But I know that Zn, because I have chosen lambda by 4, Zn should be equal to ZO2 square by Zn, which means now I know what should be my ZO2, which is under root Z, Z1, so that I can achieve impedance. So, what is the conclusion? To match Z01 and ZL, you have quarter wave line, which means length is lambda by 4 or length is lambda by 4, need not. lambda by 4 is a question that I need to use. You also know that when I have multiples of lambda by 2 added to it, I will still have tan beta L going to infinity, I will still have the same condition satisfied. So, lambda by 4 or in general length is lambda by 4 n lambda by 2, use a quarter wave line of this length with impedance, characteristic impedance which is equal to Z L times Z O 1 in between Z O 1 and Z L. Do that, I have matched Z O 1 and Z L. So, this is a very powerful way or this is very often used in electric high speed circuits to make impedance matching stubs because it is not always the case that the load that you want to connect to, it could be a, it could be a microphone or it could be an antenna. The antenna design is dependent on how much directionality you want to get and things like that, how much gain you want to get and things like that. So, finally, when you design your antenna, you might end up with an effective impedance, which is the impedance of the load in this case, which is different from the source impedance or the line impedance. So, if you can think about this as your antenna, this is the line that is carrying energy from the source to the antenna. It is not the case usually that the two impedances are matching. So, what is typically done is to use this quarter wave section in between. So, this is called as a quarter wave transformer because what this quarter wave section is ultimately doing is to create a transformed impedance at the input end 
such that the transformed impedance is matching with the input time. In that sense, it is called as a quarter wave transform. Right? This is usually the case in high speed electronic circuits. You typically use quarter wave transformers to connect your antenna or your uh, to your load to the generator circuit. And mind you, this is highly dependent on frequency. So this will work for works for specific frequencies because you know the frequencies your lambda changes so the length required will keep changing. So there is usually a tolerance associated with this design. So they typically say that you know a frequency of plus minus will give me a impedance matching with a plus minus uh, percentage tolerance. So that is the application for of a trans uh, of a transmission line itself for designing a quarter wave transformer for impedance matching circuit. What what about half wave line? If my length, for example, lambda two, sorry, lambda by not lambda by 4, lambda by 2. In this case, I know B theta. is phi. Can work out, it will turn out that Zn is equal to Zn. which means I had a, I have a line of length lambda by 2 connected to a ZL, characteristic impedance is Z0, Zn will behave or the system will behave as if there is no line, as if there is no effect of transmission line, you have only ZL connected. So the effective impedance is just ZL. How did I get this? This is by mere substitution in the previous Zn equation. So the only case where the effect of transmission line is not there is when the length is lambda by 2 or multiples of that. The last concept that I want to introduce before we go on to the electromagnetic field theory, this is like circuit theory we are doing. Now we will go on further in from the next class to say that where is the concept of electromagnetic wave coming in a transmission line and how do I solve the entire transmission line problem using a concept of electromagnetic wave, right? And where we will introduce electric field, magnetic flux, the Maxwell's equations, the wave equation and so on. We will do all that from next class but before we do that, I will take the next five minutes to discuss one last concept in the circuit theory of transmission line that is the concept of power flow. We want to ask ourselves this question. If I have a source again a Zg connected through a transmission line to a load ZL, how much of power is transferred from the source to the load. We want to know how much of power is transferred. We are talking about currents and voltages, but ultimate what would matter to us is if I, the generator is sending out a power of 1 watt, how much is dissipated at the load, right? So to do that, what we are using is, we will write down the voltage equation. We know this is V plus e power minus j beta z incident wave traveling in the forward direction plus a gamma fraction of it is reflected back. So this is j plus j e beta z and the current we know is v naught plus plus divided by z naught e power minus j current also behaves the same way 
except that the reflected current is having a phase difference which is indicated by this minus sign. Now, remember this is our z equal to 0. At z equal to 0, well, your I am going to write down what is the incident, incident voltage at the load, what is the voltage at the load and the difference, then I will calculate what is the incident power, what is the reflected power and the difference between incident and reflected power should be what is dissipated at the load, that is the idea, alright. I am going to calculate what is the incident voltage, incident current, incident power, reflected voltage, reflected current, reflected power, difference is the power dissipated in the load. So, incident voltage is V naught plus, this I am saying at the load. Incident current is V naught plus, so P incident incident power is well here there is a slight trick uh, want to be because your z z naught could be in general real or complex so p average the time average power we borrow from the circuit theory where we used complex notation, it is actually real part of V i star, complex conjugate. Even in field theory, electromagnetic field theory, we will derive the same thing, but for the moment I am borrowing that relation. So, this is real part of V naught plus because V naught could be complex Z naught of course, if it is a lossless line, it is real, but V naught in general could be complex. So, this is V naught star over Z naught, lossless case Z naught is real. So, this is V naught mod V naught square over Z naught. Now, what about the reflected case? So, how do I, so what is the reflected component? This is the incident component. Reflected component is here, alright. So, we, reflected component is, you have gamma V naught plus. Remember, it is at the load, so it is at Z equal to 0. To clarify, this part is the incident part and this is the reflected part. So, the reflected part is gamma times V naught plus, Reflect, reflected current is minus gamma times V naught plus by Z naught. So, just like how we calculated P average incident, you get P average reflected, that would be half real part of gamma V naught plus gamma star because gamma could be complex minus gamma star V naught plus star divided by Z naught. This is V naught mod square gamma mod square there is a negative sign divided by Z naught. So, I know what is incident, I know what is reflected. So, the power at the load is should be P, this is P average power dissipated at the load would be average power incident minus 
average power well i should just say the net power because you have this as your incident power you have this as your reflected power so the net power at the load would give me v not square by z not 1 minus gamma square see the negative is actually indicating that it is reflected so you know i don't have to do it twice this is the average power that will be dissipated at the load so if my gamma is 1 which means perfectly completely reflected i would have zero power dissipated at the load because the entire power is reflected back if the gamma is zero which means there is no reflection i would have you know v not square by z not which is at the transmission end completely dissipated at the load so this tells us in terms of power now what we will do tomorrow is to understand now go a little deeper to understand why this transmission line uh, is behaving this way we simply modeled as a day but now we will go deeper and understand the electromagnetic picture and the electromagnetic picture would be something for example to give you a hint of what is going to go on if i consider a coaxial line this is the central conductor this is your outer conductor when you have current through this coaxial line what you will have is a magnetic field around it you would also have an electric field from the inner to the outer conductor so we will be talking about the cross section it will be the inner conductor and let us say this is the outer conductor a current is being carried by the inner conductor which means there is a magnetic field around the inner conductor the field lines are in blue what I am drawing I would have an electric field from the inner conductor which is red lines so I have a magnetic field which is concentric, I have an electric field which is radial, the result of which is the propagation of energy along the length. So magnetic field is in this direction, electric field is in this direction, I have energy propagating in the third direction. That is actually what is happening in the transmission. Now the question you can want to ask yourself is why is magnetic field around the inner in concentric circles to the inner conductor why do you have an electric field from the inner to outer and why is there a wave which goes from along the length of the line answers to that is given by the electromagnetic picture which we will start from tomorrow all right so i close the class now and open class to uh, questions so if you have any questions please hand raise And if you do not have questions now, you can please email if you have any questions.
All right, so it's stop here. If do you have any questions, please uh, let us know either through chat window or by uh, closing the class now. So you can send you send me an email or to the team if you have any questions.